you very much. Uh, thank you to all of you for taking the time to meet. Um, well, this evening, I think it is in the, the UK or uh, if you're in the US like myself, uh, right after lunch to take some time to practice the Dhamma uh, on a Sunday. What a good, good thing. <laughs> All right, so we can start as usual with uh, some meditation practice so we can get into a comfortable seated position. And making sure that our back is up straight. We can take a few deep breaths. And relax the entire body from the top of the head to the tip of the toes. I'm taking a few moments to acknowledge the body, the felt sensation of the body. This big bundle of flesh and muscles and meat that we carry around every day. and that we're currently sitting with right now. I'm letting go of every, any thought or idea in regards to the body, any like or dislike, in regards to this experience of the body, we just allow ourselves to acknowledge having a body, sitting with this body. becoming more and more comfortable with the body as we're sitting here. Acknowledging our breath with every in-breath and out-breath as we're sitting.
not picking up any of the preoccupations from the past or for the future. Letting them all go. without grasping onto them, without holding on to them, without wanting them to disappear or to stay. But allowing them to appear and disappear on their own. We can now intentionally bring to mind the Buddha, our supreme teacher, who has taught us the Dhamma and is enabling us to practice the teachings today. Perhaps we can bring to mind a favorite representation of the Buddha. Maybe a statue. Maybe a painting. Or maybe an empty seat. A symbol of the Buddha. we can start contemplating the qualities of the Buddha, the qualities that make the Buddha such an exceptional being, such an exceptional teacher. All the qualities that we chant, whenever we mention Itipiso, Bhagava, Arahang, Sama, Sambuto, Bija, Charana, Sampano, Sugato. Loka Vitu, Anuttaro, Purisadhamma Sarati, 
Satta Deva Manusanam Bhutto Bhagavati. And we can bring to mind the qualities one by one in the mind and contemplate them. The first quality, Arahang, worthy of offerings. The Buddha is someone who has done all the work of purifying the mind. And is therefore worthy to receive any offerings of respect, any offerings of sustenance by the virtue of this purification. And we can recollect how wonderful it is to actually be worthy of offerings. What an otherworldly characteristic, what an exceptional quality that is. And how to ourselves as well by practicing this path will also be worthy. And we can now bring to mind the quality of Sama Sambuto, the quality of being self enlightened, how the Buddha not only attained awakening, but actually found the path to awakening. And we can recollect how difficult it is 
for us who have already the path to actually follow the path and to awaken ourselves. And we can imagine how much more difficult and how much more exceptional it is to have to do all of that work to find the path and then realize the path. What an amazing being can do that. What amazing qualities of mind, amazing actions, amazing habits, amazing mental perfections. that needed to be cultivated in order to get to that condition of being capable of doing the work. And we can recollect how even though perhaps we might not attain full awakening in this lifetime by following this path, we're going more and more in the direction of purification of the mind, of perfection of the mind, and of creating those conditions that are necessary to become a Sammasambhuta. So whether we attain awakening in this lifetime or in future lifetimes, everything we're doing right now is leading us towards the cessation of suffering. It's still it's leading us in a good destination. And we can now recollect another quality of the Buddha, the quality of being Vija Charana Sampanno, 
So with perfect knowledge and perfect behavior. Everything about the Buddha. Both his comportment, his actions, everything is in accordance with Dhamma. Everything that he says, does, or thinks is impeccable. How extraordinary to have that level of conduct, that level of knowledge. And this is also why we say that the Buddha is Sugato, well gone. The quality of having reached a good destination. The destination of the cessation of suffering. A place of perfection. And also what we call the deathless state. Gone beyond birth, gone beyond old age, gone beyond sickness, and gone beyond death. Another quality of the Buddha is to be loka vidu, knower of the world, not confused by this world or other worlds. He understands the nature of the world. is unbothered by the world. How wonderful not to be confused. By the world. Not to be shaken.
by current events. Not to be afraid of other states of existence. And not to crave other states of existence. But be completely in the knowing and the understanding of how things are. And two other fantastic qualities of the Buddha are that he is Anuttaro Purisadhamma Sarati, the supreme trainer of those who wants to, those who can be trained. And he is also Sata Deva Manusanam the teacher of both humans and devas. So not only has he been able to realize the cessation of suffering, realize the Dhamma, discover the Dhamma, understand things the way they are and dispel ignorance. He's also capable of teaching anyone who wants to be taught. Whether human or non-human. What an extraordinary quality. And what a blessing to still have these teachings. which can also lead us to the same destination of the Buddha, to the last two qualities of the Buddha that are Bhutto, the awakened one, and Bhagava, the one who is magnificent, the fortunate one. The one who has understood the origin of all things. And so we can spend the last moments of our meditation practice recollecting all of these wonderful qualities of the Buddha and how we're becoming more and more like the Buddha as we practice the teachings of the Buddha.
We can now slowly bring our hands in Anjali. Stay here for a few moments. And together we can say three times sadhu and slowly come out of our meditation practice. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. At this point, we can relax a little bit the body and do a few stretches if we need to. And uh, we can now start by paying homage to our, the Buddha. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Uttam dhammam sangham namasami hmm. Isn't it great to recollect the qualities of the Buddha? <laughs> One of my favorite meditation practices um, really, yeah, brightens up the mind, really makes it, um, yeah, just so pleasant to be on the, even more pleasant to, to practice along the path and really um, brings to mind why we're doing essentially this, this practice, right? Sometimes it can be a little bit, a little bit dukkha because uh, of the dukkha, right? Getting, uh, becoming more aware of, of the suffering that there is in our experience, the suffering that there is in um, the experience of others, the, the suffering that there is in the world. And then trying to practice, we can be a little bit too hard on ourselves here and there, right? So then um, it's really good to, to have these um, meditation practices that are a little bit um not a little bit, that are very uplifting, <laughs> that actually really um, remind us uh, about the third noble truth, uh, remind us about the cessation of suffering, remind us of uh, who is our teacher, remind us of actually the possibilities, remind us of the really good news of Buddhism that you know, really actually teaches us at the end of suffering. And um, and we have such an exemplary teacher and, you know, all the beautiful statues that we have, I have to say, wow, I mean, it's, they're just so incredible, you know? Uh, even non-Buddhists actually are attracted to the, the image of the Buddha, sometimes a little bit unskillfully. <laughs> <laughs> right especially in the west you can see a lot of kind of crazy depictions of the buddha sometimes uh you know like pot holders and uh, door stoppers or tea cups and and so forth which is not exactly really proper or really you know um giving the right place to the buddha but at the same time behind that we should also recollect that there must be something that is kind of this universal message that attracts everyone to this image of peace of calm of um of yeah of tranquility of uh, sort of cessation of of suffering essentially and so there is this universal way universal message that um that is is true you know it's uh, that attraction towards the truth 
uh, which, um, if I remember correctly, is the topic of, of today, right? So it's it's very interesting, especially in these days where there is a lot of talk of, you know, this is my truth and this is your truth, <laughs> right? And uh, sometimes it can be really interesting uh, to really then then think what exactly is truth? What is this truth that we're talking about? And in Buddhism, actually, we don't have even one truth. We have four. <laughs> and they're not, you know, the truths of the Buddha. They're not uh, our truth. They're not their truth. But they're actually um, the truth. They are noble truths. Not ordinary truths, but actually really super mundane truths. Uh, so the truth, of course, of suffering, the truth of that is the cause of suffering, the truth of the end of suffering, and the truth of the way out of suffering. And it's interesting, because even though we always talk about these four noble truths, obviously, in, in Buddhism, um, us practitioners, a lot of time, actually, very much get into the my truth, your truth. <laughs> Right. Also, within traditions, uh, we can we can be very opinionated, right? So, if we're maybe Mahayana practitioners, we're like, no, only the Bodhisattva path is the right path, not like those Hinayanas. Or if we're, you know, uh, practicing in the Theravada tradition, or we're passionate about early Buddhism, we're like, ah, oh, what is all this nonsensical thing that came after the Buddha? You know, only my path is right, everyone else's path is wrong. <laughs> are you reading that sutta, or what is, uh, you know, what are the books uh, that you're getting that from, and this and that? <laughs> And so we see actually in the early texts uh, that it's not, it wasn't terribly different, even at the time of the Buddha. <laughs> and the Buddha is like, yeah, actually, it's reported to say in the suttas, yeah, that's, that's really not, not the way to, to find truth. That's really not the way to go about things. Um, it's really not, not really skillful. That really doesn't bring to bring us towards enlightenment, looking at the flaws, you know, like what people are saying, uh, trying to outsmart them, um, right? Uh, but actually what he says that brings in, instead us towards, um, towards the truth, what kind of thoughts we're supposed to entertain in our mind is once again, going back to the Four Noble Truths. So always going back to this is, you know, this is Dukkha. Um, this is the cause of dukkha, this is the end of dukkha, and this is the way out of dukkha, right? And so it's actually something so practical, so uh, to the point that we can always have an opportunity. Actually, it's so profound because we can always see how a lot of times we're engaging in thoughts, we're actually doing a lot of things when actually we can just stop doing that and go back uh, to just four things, right? And in that way, he's like, okay, those conditions um, allow us, empower us to actually really see the truth and, um, and pierce it and realize it. And he says, of course, that, you know, the truth of Dukkha then needs to be understood. Uh, then the, the, the truth of uh, the cause of Dukkha needs to be essentially given up. We need to give up the cause, right? we need to give up the tanha, we need to give up that endless thirst uh, that causes our dukkha. Uh, and then he tells us that the cessation of dukkha, so the third noble truth, needs to be realized, and that the noble eightfold path, so the fourth noble truth, needs to be developed, so that we have these eight things that we need to be developed. And so that can be always our, our going back uh, going back to it but um it's very interesting because we have actually this sutta that i've been contemplating a lot in the past couple of uh of months the chanki sutta in uh in the majumani nikaya where the buddha gives us goes even further right there's um in his teachings of how to access truth and he essentially in that sutta um 
he's actually speaking to uh, some Brahmins um, and um, that obviously were very much holding on to, you know, one of their, uh, holding on to their beliefs. Uh, they were coming from a belief system and they had a belief system that, you know, had really good credentials, <laughs> had been transmitted very accurately for, for quite a long, long time, um, you know, was coming from people who looked and appeared, you know, to have a very good standing intellectually and so forth. And, um, you know, that's what they, they essentially um, thought was the truth. And so as they are uh, discussing with the Buddha, um, the Buddha essentially, they ask him, well, what do you think? You know, we think this is truth. What do you think? <laughs> Don't you think this is this truth as well? Like we, we definitely have... Uh, good credentials, right? And uh, the Buddha gives this beautiful, incredibly beautiful teaching that I think can be actually very good for us, even though we might not be Brahmins, <laughs> uh, even though we are Buddhists. So technically, we're already sort of believing, quote unquote, in the, the teachings of the Buddha. Otherwise, we wouldn't be gathered here, at least if we're not believing in them, at least we, we're taking them into, you know, some good consideration, right? So we're already like with uh, definitely one foot inside the door. <laughs> So whatever it is that, uh, whatever is our relationship with Buddhism, definitely we are taking these teachings into consideration. But I think this is actually very, very important, especially um, even more so actually for us Buddhists, um, 2,500 years after the Buddha, to actually not think of ourselves too different from the Brahmins that we encounter in the in the early texts and to see how do these teachings apply to us, you know? And uh, the Buddha essentially says um, that um, he's like, okay, well, clearly you have faith, right? He, he tells the Brahmins, you have definitely, you're speaking uh, on faith on, uh, on these teachings uh, that you're bringing up to me. And that is what makes you uh, think that essentially this is the truth that you're holding. And he says that fundamentally, actually, there is different ways through which we can uh, believe in things, which uh, obviously is a is a very similar uh, uh, similar similar sort of instruction than that he gives the the Buddha on many different occasions. But the one that is the most known is uh, in the Kalama Sutta, right, when he's talking to the Kalamas. So um, acknowledging basically that one can hold all sorts of beliefs, right? Because either one takes something out of faith um, or someone uh, takes it out of actually logical inference, um, especially these days, I think. Well, definitely that was me also with the teachings of the Buddha. I was like, oh, this makes sense. Finally, something that makes sense, <laughs> right? And this is what um, made me take these teachings on um then some folks have it through oral tradition right or through a written tradition these days um maybe perhaps a lot of people who are born buddhist um they have lots of faith and they also have a tradition maybe they come from a buddhist uh, buddhist country that was you know buddhism was the teachings of their their parents their relatives and so they bring it they're like okay this is great and on top of that it also makes sense so maybe it's also like logical inference on it <laughs> And then um, another way that we can take on things is uh, by es essentially accepting it. Uh, maybe we like it, you know, actually I quite like the teachings of the Buddha. So that I would say that <laughs> it's also a way through which, uh, right, I accept these teachings. And the Buddha then says, okay, so these are certain ways through which we can assert, we can take things on. Um, but sometimes, you know, if we take these things on, whether it's by faith, logical inference, because we like it, uh, oral tradition and so forth, sometimes actually, you know, the truth that we think is a truth is in fact a truth. And sometimes instead, uh, we can uh, be wrong about it, <laughs> right? And so then we can think, oh, wow, you know, I have the teachings of the Buddha. Could that apply for me as well? Hmm. Right? For all of these these teachings, because could I be actually wrong? <laughs> could I be right? How do I know? How do I know whether I'm right uh, or I'm wrong, right? Whether this is correct or not correct. 
And so that's, you know, one of the qualities of the Dhamma, of course, is that it invites us to come and see for ourselves. But how does that actually plays out? And in the Chanki Sutta, it's very, very interesting because then the Buddha tells us actually that in order to access truth, in order to really understand what truth is, in order to know for ourselves, not because someone else tells us, not because we like it, not because of all the, you know, the different reasons that we went through about through it. We have to first preserve truth. We have to first actually create the conditions so that we're in alignment with truth. And so this is something that I've been reflecting upon a lot because normally, even probably in this talk, um, many times I've said, the Buddha said, the Buddha said, right? But have I actually ever met the Buddha? I mean, have I heard what the Buddha said? No. So it's actually, I haven't been really preserving, preserving truth. Bad Ayasoma. <laughs> because what we should be doing, and the Buddha says to qualify essentially the truth. So saying, well, I have faith that the Buddha said this, or maybe I have read in the suttas that the Buddha said this, or um, my parents or my teacher told me that the Buddha said this, right? Whatever kind of qualifier. And he says that um, in in that in the Chanki Sutta, he says that to the Brahmins. He says it's okay, you know, to actually take on something out of faith. It's okay to take something on out of logical inference and so forth. Um, but one preserves truth when one is actually qualifying that instead of going only this is true everything else is wrong but rather going okay actually this is i have a lot of faith in this and i think this is the truth and i'm presenting to it and by qualifying essentially where we're getting our truth we're creating an openness also in the mind to actually understand really uh, the matter that we are that we believe is true and also if we are instead um, presented with not someone's truth, but actually a real truth, then we also have an openness that we are not too clung towards our sort of idea, right? So if, um, you know, perhaps we're, we're very into our Theravada Buddhism <laughs> and we're not interested in the Bodhisattva path because we think it's like later on, right? But maybe actually they're right. <laughs> So we create that openness and vice versa. If we only think that, you know, the Bodhisattva path is the way uh, and we're not really interested in that Hinayana like ideal of the Arhat, um, if we don't cling to it or we qualify it, we qualify the reason why uh, we think that the Bodhisattva path is the right path, then we can actually create an openness for the Arhat path in case actually they might be right. Um, so it creates this flexibility of mind that is extremely extremely important and then the buddha goes further right in the chanki sutta he, he also um goes further he says okay so once one has uh preserved the truth so has inclined um the mind towards the truth well i don't think he actually says it in the chanki sutta now that i am <laughs> Uh, I recall, but we can see throughout the suttas actually that another way through which we incline the mind obviously is by taking the precept of not lying, right? So abstaining uh, from lying is actually one of the strongest ways through which we incline the mind towards towards truth. So we actually, as I like to always say this uh, Italian saying, <laughs> appetite comes through eating. So the more we we eat, essentially truth <laughs> uh, the least uh, uh right we're inclined towards something that tastes kind of like dodgy like you know uh, lies right we're kind of like oh that's gross i don't want to do that but if we do the other it's no different than eating right the more we eat junk food the more we want junk food and the more we eat salad the more we're like oh i don't really want that junk food actually it really makes me feel bad so it's the same exact thing so we want to do all of these things that actually direct the mind incline the mind towards truth then the buddha getting back to the chanki sutta uh, he basically gives us um, then a context uh, when he's speaking to the Brahmin. He's like, okay, well, first and foremost, in order to take on anything, one needs to actually scrutinize. One needs to like look at where are these teachings coming from? Who is the teacher? 
uh, that is actually proclaiming these teachings, right? And he actually encourages the Brahmin. So in this case, we don't have our teacher anymore in flesh and bones, <laughs> but we do have um, the text through which we can access them, the Buddha. So looking at the qualities of Buddha, which is why um, we also did the meditation beforehand, uh, the Buddha Nusati, so recollecting the qualities of the Buddha. So really looking um, at who are actually putting... Um, uh, who are we relying upon? And the Buddha is not saying, you know, like, for example, take me immediately as a teacher, but actually he invites all of his followers to really look at, um, at his mind, look at his teaching and evaluate them and go, is there any um, greed, hatred and delusion essentially in the Buddha <laughs> or his teachings? Is there anything that could create the conditions for us to... Um, yeah, make any kind of deeds uh, through body, speech, and mind that would create greed, hatred, and delusion in each one of us. And so we can actually look at that. This is also a very interesting way, I would say, to um, to really also um, look at all the teachings that we have, uh, not only in the Theravada tradition, but in the Mahayana tradition and so forth, right? We can kind of see this flavor of Dhamma. Uh, we can actually use this sort of framework to, to really look at that um, and also the effect in our minds. And also when we're interacting with teachers or when we're going to like within a Dharma group, right? Um, obviously not expecting uh, to, that all the monastics are our houses and not expecting them to be <laughs> copy and paste of the Buddha, but also not, um, not you know not expecting them to at least try to be like the buddha do you see what i mean um and so if we actually see uh, for example certain conducts uh, that um that are inviting greed hatred and delusion right so misconducts of different sorts dodgy things that dodgy reputations actually there is the invitation we see in the early text to actually really look at that really ponder that and be a little bit suspicious rightly so these days, that's one of the good things of Google is that actually before going to a Buddhist center, we can usually <laughs> Google. Um, that's what I used to do. I would put the name of the <laughs> of the center and then like sexual misconduct <laughs> or cult or, you know, like keywords like that. And then usually, you know, if it's a reputable place, <laughs> there's nothing really coming up and if it's a bit of a sketchy dodgy place then there's lots of different things that we can find on the internet so we can use actually technology to our advantage right and then of course maybe one or two bad reviews from grumpy people online it's not the end of the, the day but there's a difference between right like i didn't like the food at such and such monastery <laughs> to actually the teacher is a creep and uh, they've been um you know, doing this and this other sexual misconduct or extortion or trying to get money out of people and so forth. And so actually, that's also the preliminary work that we see uh, that the Buddha encourages us to do. And then there is a beautiful, actually, um, string of dependent origination that we see uh, in, the, in the Chanki Sutta that I really adore. It's really kind of like a bit of a, I love the, the sort of... Um, alternative we can call them dependent originations the alternative paticca samupada <laughs> that the buddha ge uh, gives us throughout the suttas right that we read throughout the suttas uh, that give us a bit of a different flavor and a different understanding also of the the work that we need to do but so yeah so after we've actually you know we're like okay i found the a teaching that you know seems all right that is not um, increasing greed, hatred, and delusion. Uh, a teacher or teachers that seem relatively sane, <laughs> that don't seem like they're terribly interested in uh, in my money or like my person or like you know um, extortion of sorts. Then uh, what can I do? Right. Well, um, then the Buddha says that that is actually the right condition where we can start having faith. We can allow ourselves to have faith in them very interesting all right kind of like we create a nice base of faith 
And then from there, we actually start paying respects to them because we, it's someone that we have paid faith. It's kind of like very interesting because the paying of respects, it's actually something that is supportive. The Buddha is reported to say in the suttas um, for us. That's why we bow a lot in Buddhism. We tend to think, oh, we're bowing to the other you know, people, et cetera, et cetera. But actually that creates the sort of first sort of <laughs> elements for the mind to incline towards um, listening to the Dhamma, towards listening to what? Uh, we have to say we can actually also think about it in in terms of old school um sort of parenting and modern parenting right usually these days we kind of see you know children and um parents being very very on the same sort of level and they're kind of like talking to each other etc and like the buddha uh, sorry the buddha the the children a lot of the times they're not really listening to the parents and they're kind of doing <laughs> whatever they want <laughs> Right, but in kind of a little bit more old school parenting, where it's a little bit more formalized, uh, where the the children do pay respects, they're also like listening a little bit more to the parents, right? <laughs> a little bit more disciplined. So in that way, we can see that actually, when we are paying respect, we're actually creating the conditions for our minds to be more receptive towards the message. So it's not really about our like idea whether it should be a more egalitarian rela relationship or like a more you know this or that like it's not an abstract thought it's not um a political idea but rather it's how do we why do we pay respects it's to create the conditions for our mind to be good recipients to be the you know the simile that we see in the suttas the the bowl that is empty and like right there with no cracks ready to be uh, capable of being full, filled with uh, with the water, filled with the dhamma, right? So as we pay respects, then of course the if we are you know nice and and um, decent with, for example, Ajahn Brahm, then Ajahn Brahm will also be more likely to want to hang out with us. Except in and on the contrary, you no, know, if we're a little bit um, not the nicest people and uh, not courteous and not ah, well maybe Ajahn Brahm is going to go like ah, you know that person over there is they're a little bit crazy actually disrespectful they're not really nice to to be hung, hung with them, right so that will create a little bit less opportunities for us to have access to the Dhamma and so as we create uh, these conditions of respect in our mind then we create these conditions for receiving the the Dhamma listening to the Dhamma and then the uh, the Buddha encourages us to remember the Dhamma uh, and to recollect the Dhamma, right? So ideally, you want to also kind of somewhat memorize it uh, to one degree or the other, to study it, we may say, and then to contemplate it. This is what the Buddha encourages us in all these different links of dependent origination. So one is dependent to the other. And so as we contemplate it, we contemplate it, we reflect on the meaning, and then we start accepting it right and as we accept something as as true we're like okay this makes a lot of sense and it's not just a kind of arbitrary thought but it's something that i'm i'm holding um dear to me i am becoming more and more inclined this is great and we start seeing this whole enthusiasm and this kind of like yeah you know, awakening. Yes. It's not like, oh yeah, I've heard this, you know, mindfulness-based stress reduction, but it's rather, it's like, oh wow, this is, you know, this really great practice that I can actually um, do that is relieving me from, that is removing suffering for me. This is kind of like a matter of life and death, right? We get really enthusiastic about it. Like, yes, I'm going to shave my head <laughs> and put the, the yoga robe. No, you don't have to do that, but can still practice right and they can still be there has to be that enthusiasm and um the buddha says that's part of the process yes that's a great thing because the enthusiasm then will build our effort wanting to actually uh, put effort in our practice put our effort into um stilling the mind and putting effort into uh, seeing you know the the characteristics of existence and each putting effort into restraining um our greed 
uh, putting effort into, um, yeah, taming the mind, putting effort into restraining the senses, right? All of that, because we actually are taking these, these teachings at heart. They mean a lot to us, right? And then, yeah, we, we just, um, we're, we're starting to absorb it. We start to, to transform the mind with it as we are, are we're doing this practice. And, um, and then essentially start realizing, start, starting to see it for ourselves. And the Buddha says that basically, essentially this process is very interesting. He's like, okay, this actually leads you to seeing the truth for yourself but that's not the end of it <laughs> then you don't find, like finish the whole work um it's not finished in order to actually secure it to do the don deal you have to repeat it all over again over and over again but still the way once we see the truth that means basically becoming a stream enter so <laughs> um yeah a stream winner so the the stage where we don't we can't backslide anymore we're safe doesn't doesn't matter how long it takes from there <laughs> it's like basically we've done most of the most of the work right and it's kind of such a very interesting way to think that at the very beginning of this dependent origination there has to be a preservation of truth and there has to be that accountability of how are we holding everything that we're holding because sometimes uh, getting back to our sort of state current state <laughs> 2500 years after the buddha where there is no buddha where we can go and actually ask him all right did you actually say this uh, venerable <laughs> or is this some kind of later interpolation um there has to be really a qualification because there's sometimes there can be so many like opposite mixed messages right uh, even within one monastery of the same tradition, there can be even different monastics uh, speaking in a different way, talking about things in a different way. And so if we kind of like get fossilized in one way, we might actually be fossilized also in, in wrong thinking. We might be fossilized in, uh, or we might be really lucky and we actually get everything that's really good karma that you got, <laughs> right teacher, right teachings, right? Uh, but it's a bit of a high bet. So I feel like we, all of us should be a little bit careful and really start looking once, uh, once again, do a little bit, go, go a little bit before and see how can we, how can we align ourselves towards the truth and how can we preserve the truth in every moment? So anyway, so these are a few, few reflections that come um, this afternoon or this evening, if you're in the UK, and at this point, if uh, there are any, any questions or considerations, we can open it up. Great, and I see that Manori has put the link towards the Chanki Sutta, great. And thank you very much, Isoma. This is, as always, the best way to ask a question is to put your digital hand up. But because we're such a small group, I think you can also just put your physical hand up and I can see you as well. all right well maybe we can do some more meditation <laughs> and we can also talk about uh, if you have questions that are not related to the talk that's also okay i will ask a question that's kind of related to the talk so it's possible, as you mentioned, to have teachers who are producing very beautiful teachings and beautiful communities, but whose visions of the Buddha's teachings may be quite different. And the manifestations for the practice can be quite different. 
would you find a way to know which part of the different teachings from different communities you would want to follow or would you find it beautiful to be as open as possible and to try and accept all the different aspects even if sometimes they're contradictory to each other thank you so much Derek for that that question it's very interesting very good um yeah well I mean obviously I'm a bit bias uh, in the sense that I run a non-sectarian monastery so since the very beginning we've been open to uh, there a lot of different traditions uh, both within um, the quote-unquote Theravada sort of um, system but also actually with, within Mahayana and Vajrayana so when Buddhist Insights started in 2016 we were literally every week we were we had a different monastic from a different tradition. Um, and I feel like it can be subjective, a subjective thing for, for folks. Uh, some people can find it a little bit sometimes um, confusing to have so many different, you know, the same thing said in so many different ways, <laughs> if, you, if you may. Um, I personally found it actually very enriching um also in particular Mahayana teachings historically for example come um I mean are based right on the early teachings of the Buddha but come a little bit later in time for the most part obviously not when we talk about Mahayana we're talking about quite a lot and of course the Agamas are uh the body of um literature that is common to all the the different traditions but when we think about the stereotypical sort of idea of, of Mahayana um, a practice um, and the history of it, it's a little bit kind of um, later. And so there's ways sometimes, especially in the Zen tradition or in Chan, um, there's a lot of provocative ways actually to talk about the Dhamma and also provocative suttas, you know, for example, where Maybe Guan Yin uh, Valkiteshvara is talking to Sariputta, and Sariputta is actually not the greatest um, sort of arhat that we see in the early text, but is actually a little bit, you know, confused. And um, Guan Yin is always kind of like teaching him a lesson, and he's uh, a little bit, yeah, like not really that wise. And you know, for us, it can be like oh, <laughs> very. <laughs> very shocking and you know right through the heart and we're like oh what is this really terrible nonsense and so profane and so like <laughs> blasphemous kind of thing uh but it actually is meant my understanding it's meant to have that tone it's meant to create those conditions for us to kind of be a little bit unsettled to shake ourselves from the idea that actually we can access truth and we can know truth just because we read it in a book for example right <laughs> and uh so back in the day especially there was um maybe a lot at a certain point which is also one of the causes of the disappearance of Buddhism in India is that the monastics became so intellectual so into their heads and they knew everything about all the texts, so, um, but they actually didn't know anything. They hadn't really experienced the Dhamma. And so there were a lot of provocative ways through which other monastics would try to create those conditions for, for the mind to kind of uh, be shaken and um, <laughs> and not get, it, get fossilized in, um, in sort of the intellectual side of the Dhamma, which can be delicious, you know, so like I completely understand. <laughs> so that we have to see for ourselves, what are the effects in our minds? So I would say always going back to the instructions that we also see actually in the Sutta, in the Chanki Sutta of like, is it is in relation to finding a teacher. So for example, greed, hatred and illusion. So is greed, hatred, and delusion increasing or decreasing in my mind? So I think then we can evaluate it. So if we're like listening to a teacher and we're getting more confused because maybe they're saying things that it doesn't matter whether it's good dhamma or not dhamma, but if we're getting more confused, then we're just not ready for it. Or if we're getting angry, maybe that's not really a good idea. Uh, or if we're getting more greedy, that's definitely not a good idea. <laughs> But instead, if it's just shaking us a little bit and making us question um, 
our understanding of the Dhamma, then that's very healthy. That's very good. And we always want to be questioning that, you know, one of the, my favorite Mahayana things, actually, that was the first thing that I read when I encountered Buddhism, paradoxically, when I went to Santa Chitparama Theravada Monastery, I picked up this um, book a long, long time ago that um, was a Zen book, I didn't know back then, and the difference, and said something along the lines, when you think you've killed the Buddha, and when you think you've seen the Buddha kill the Buddha, which is very shocking for all of us, we're all like, you know, like, whoa, what? Um, obviously it doesn't meta it doesn't literally mean to kill the Buddha like physically, but rather to kill the idea that we have uh until we are awakened. So to constantly question our understanding of enlightenment, to constantly question our understanding of realization, to constantly question our attainments, to constantly question, right, what what we think is the Dhamma, which doesn't mean a skeptical doubt. It doesn't mean like the hindrance, right, of doubt, but rather what it means is to do this this investigation that we see once again also in the in in the Chanki Sutta that encouragement to really investigate something, to really ponder ponder it, um, to really look look it up, take bring it back up. So I would say with anything, uh, we should always look at the result what is the result in, in the mind um whatever we're interacting whatever person or whatever material we're interacting with and um yeah sometimes there also can be suttas actually i remember early in my path in my buddhist path there were some suttas that i was kind of like oh this is completely crazy uh i i don't i don't like this you know and it would create a lot of um skeptical doubt in my mind and I remember thinking, well, actually, well, what? Why am I putting so much, eff like, so much time and effort into these suttas? Maybe right now it's not the right moment, so I'll shelf them <laughs> and get back to them later. <laughs> and that actually worked uh, because then I was focusing on things that instead were were useful and brightening my mind. And then at a certain point, I was able to pick up those suttas. So I would say it's the same thing or some others, you know, I was just like, no, nah, I'm still not get going there, you know? <laughs> so I don't know if that answered <laughs> your question or if you have any thoughts on that. <laughs> or if other people disagree. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, please, please. I can do a small comment as well, Aya. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm tradition. I'm traditionally from a, um, you know, traditional Theravada Buddhist country. But even even where I'm coming from, Sri Lanka is um, this this sutta is quite relevant these days, probably long time as well. So you can see there are these um, arahat, um, you know people or shortcuts to uh, be uh, stream enterers and certificates and all kinds of people coming in and having their own teaching. Don't go to the other teachers, only my teaching, that kind of, you know, cult-like thing. So, so you know, how, how do people, you know, understand whether it is uh, correct or not? Is um, You can see that something is, you know, not correct. Um, I I actually came to, although I'm from Sri Lanka, I came to Buddhism properly during the pandemic. And then I was searching for things and then these things are coming up in the YouTube. And uh, I knew that this, it is not making me peaceful and something is wrong here. So I was kind of shortlisting my teachers that my mind was going with. And uh, so it was a it was a practical thing that I encountered as well thank you Bhattu, thank you so much Panari, for for sharing that yes actually that is so important yeah all the teachings of the buddha have to lead towards 
yeah, towards uh, this passion, uh, towards peace, uh, towards um, Nibbana, right? So if we instead don't have that result, um, then it's very good to question that. So, so thank you so much for sharing it because uh, I feel like that's that's the encouragement for the Buddha that the Buddha also is giving us, um, you know, in the, in the Chanki Sutta is to really not get too comfortable with whatever thing we we are taking on because sometimes it can be so random and um sometimes we can be very lucky you know maybe we're just randomly like taking the right thing up <laughs> but uh what if we're not uh, then that can be very very dangerous and it's such a waste of time and liz has uh, the hand up <laughs> Hi, uh, thank you very much for your talk. I, my way is, might be a bit of a strange way, but me, I go back to the Kalama Sutta and the Four Noble Truths. And I sit with the Buddha very humbly at the back when he talks to the Kalama. For me, that's the way, if it doesn't fit with the criteria, I uh, tend to give it a wide berth. But I, I think sometimes maybe I'm a bit uh, limiting myself there. But on the other hand, I, I, well, during the pandemic and before and after, I've listened to loads of teachings. And uh, I always go back really to, to certain um, teachers like Bhikkhu Bodhi, uh, Bhikkhu Anarayo, and uh, because I feel safe. I mean, they might mes make mistakes, that is true, uh, but they are mistakes which are made by with goodwill, with, there is no questioning their motives, whereas with some, I do question their motives. Uh, am I being too tough there? <laughs> Thank you, Liz, um, for sharing that. Well, and you got really good karma, both uh, Bante Body and Bante Alio. <laughs> Pretty good. <laughs> Actually, Bante Body, I was just on a retreat with him this past weekend uh, that he did his first uh, in-person retreat after the pandemic. So I was really glad to be able to see him in person. Um, so I'm a big fan. Actually, he officially converted me to Buddhism <laughs> in this lifetime. He did that so, for me too. Yeah. I, I was feeling oh, terribly, terribly down. I had loads of problems. I won't go into details, but... Uh, saying that I was feeling down is an understatement. I was really mm. contemplating not very good things. And I, I went on YouTube and I wasn't looking for uh, for anything Buddhist or anything like that. And I saw his smile and I thought, oh, he's got something that I want. <laughs> and I, I put that video on. I didn't listen to what he was saying. I was just looking at his body language. And I thought that that is important, and that went on from there. Yeah, yeah. No, I think yeah. you're. Um, I mean, <laughs> on the right track. Once again, it's that evaluation also of the mind. So you see, once again, that when we are on the right path, then unwholesome mind states decrease and wholesome mind states increase, um, and so that's where we can actually know right that's also what the buddha is pointing mm. out with us like we can know for ourselves there's not someone else that needs to tell us oh okay like you know you're you're becoming happier we actually know <laughs> right so if uh we are listening to some good dhamma uh, then that will be the effect it's actually what manari was saying earlier uh it's essentially it doesn't matter how long we've been practicing we can always evaluate that um, and uh, from how our practice is doing, how it's increasing or, or if it's decreasing. Um, and then it's good if it's decreasing not to keep doing the same thing, right? <laughs> we wouldn't be doing that if it was the body. If the body, like if we were taking some medicine and our body was like getting worse instead of 
getting better. We would stop the medicine. We would look for another medicine. We would, you know, look for another doctor. We wouldn't like keep doing what we're doing. We can, we're actually quite smart when it comes to the body more or less. Um, but when it comes to non-material things, we can be a little bit kind of crazy sometimes. <laughs> oh, oh, uh, irrational. Yeah. So when we get back, yeah, let, if we start thinking, at, if we take immaterial things, with the same seriousness as we take uh, the Im as the material, then I think we make better choices. <laughs> so yeah, seems like you're you're in the right direction. Thank you, thank you. Mm -hmm. Maybe well. All right, and five more minutes. If there's anyone else that wants to share anything. All right, maybe that's all for this evening. Well, I want to thank so much Derek, Matthias, and Manoli. <laughs> Not necessarily in this particular order. <laughs> it can also be Manoli, Derek, and Matthias. <laughs> or Matthias, Manoli, and Derek. <laughs> uh, for, um, yeah, like just creating this beautiful space where to meet and supporting Venerable Chanda on retreat. It's been a pleasure to contribute a little bit, a little drop in this um, ocean of, of teachings uh, to support her while she's uh, practicing in um, in Australia. So, uh, so lovely to see the Anukampa community flourishing and flourishing. So Anumadana Sadhu to all of you for supporting this beautiful project and showing up for the teachings and yeah, being great Dharma practitioners. So may you always be well, happy and peaceful and may all the things come to you. And I'll pass it on to, I don't know, Manari or Derek or Matthias that you might have some announcements. <laughs> we would especially like to thank you for your time and teachings and generosity and guidance. So thank you so much for being here and supporting us as well in our practice. My pleasure. And thank you to the community for always being here week in, week out and for building a beautiful community together. And it's something which is very precious. So thank you all. And especially for anybody listening on YouTube, when this goes on YouTube soon, if you would like to support the Anukampra project and help us to build a community together, you can do so by visiting anukampaproject.org forward slash donate. And I know everybody in the room now is a great supporter of the project, so it doesn't need reminding of that address. But thank you all for being here and see you again soon. Thank you, Isoma. Thank you. May you be well.